Our first story deals with a subculture of heavy metal music that some feel is sending a dangerous message to your kids. The forces of evil on the dark side of devil rock. And I want to talk tonight about the devil and demons and witches and wizards. And we just mix it up with hardcore and aggression and come out with something that we think is an original sound. Loud, fast, heavy, you know. Well, what do you got? What do you got? You're listening to Riff Worship, the podcast that attempts to answer the age-old question, what makes a riff? Why do we care about the riffs? Sometimes albums containing our favorite riffs. I'm one of your hosts, Austin Paulson, with me, as always, the Baldini, the Great Bald Hope, Arkansas's prodigal son, Dylan W. Hatt. What's up, buddy? Not a whole lot, man. It's, uh, I got my grind gear on, <laughs> uh, ready for this, uh, this weirdo record. Um, yeah. Really, really ready for this. We're down. We're down one member we this are, week. We are down. It's we're going old school. We yeah. are uh, back to the basics. The, back to the basics, man. The oldest man on the planet is taking his first trip to Florida to figure out where he's going to retire to in the next few years. Uh, you know they have those communities down there, and they have like pineapples everywhere. If you catch what I'm oh, saying. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he's in. Yeah, the, you know he's he's, he's all about the, that. He's in the community. He's in the community. It's like that Bob's Burgers episode, man, with uh, oh, the be. grandfather and the balloons. It's hysterical. <laughs> I gotta watch that. I'm not familiar. Oh, uh, I yeah, that one in particular. Uh, but yeah, we're down one. It's a bummer. Uh, maybe he just got. Uh, we put a lot on him here recently. We we've we're, you know, we we've been through a lot. We've been through a pretty a lot of really long, dense records that are enjoyable, really heavy records. But tires an old fella out like him. Yeah. He just needs to reset, maybe play a little <laughs> shuffleboard while he's there. But yeah, we got uh, we got an interesting one this week. We're doing a grind record without swindle. Yeah, it seems it seems uh, sacrilegious in a way. But we had to talk about something this week. <laughs> we we had to. Uh, we're stepping away from um, we're stepping away from Louisiana for a little bit. Yeah, going to the East Coast, New York City, or. All, I think everybody's from everywhere around the yeah. East Coast. Got some Philly, got some uh, New York for sure. Um, they're from all over the place. But yeah, we're talking about Brutal Truth today. More specifically, Need to Control from 1994. Hell of a year. Great year. Yeah, it really was. There's I mean, a we've lot of our, shit that came out that record. What, what did we cover already from 94? Do you remember? If we haven't covered anything from 94, we've definitely talked about things based around 1994 a lot. I'd have to go back. You know, once you get up to my age, it just all like turns to mush up there. I hope Swindle finds a place for you in Florida, too. Damn. I'm old, but I'm not Swindle old. Um, what's your uh, what's your relationship with Brutal Truth? So the first issue of Decibel magazine I ever bought was a was a Slayer issue. And Matt, actually, hold on. You got it. There it is. That issue wow, right there. Look at that fucking logo. Like this is the first issue of Decibel magazine I ever picked it up or is ever picked up. I picked it up at a two. It's like August or something of 2006. August 06. So I picked it up at a Barnes and Noble in July of 2006 in South Carolina. Um, and I just picked it up because Slayer was on the cover and it had a cool poster at the time in which I have lost throughout the years. But uh, Brutal Truth graces the Hall of Fame induction here for Need to Control. Yeah. So from 16 years old, I knew what the record was. Um, never didn't get a chance to listen to the album in full until I was probably 18 or 19. Um, but I remember seeing the artwork for Need to Control and just going, OK, this is this is something I got to dig into here. Um, and I remember the God Player video was like on early YouTube, like for whatever reason, you could see Eric Records uh, videos on like early YouTube, like 05, 06. Sure. So that video was on there. I didn't know what to think of it at first because it's got uh, Steve Irwin instruments in it. It does. We'll get into that in a little while. Yep. Also, learning that Dan Lilker is essentially brutal truth. He was brutal truth. Um and knowing his lineage with anthrax and not necessarily knowing much about nuclear assault at that point, but knowing that he was in that band and I'd seen him in like some promo shots from um, a couple different books I'd read throughout the years. 
Uh, but knowing like, oh, that guy was in Anthrax for a minute and now he's doing this and what a fucking record. Uh, yeah, Dan Loker's uh, lineage in heavy extreme music, I mean, goes far back. It is far reaching into all genres of heavy music, thrash, black metal, grindcore, death yep. metal. Um, yeah, my introduction to at least Dan's playing or just output is anthrax and nuclear assault like i came up through that stuff for sure i thought you were gonna say sod honestly i i did get it into sod eventually for sure i mean i was i was very much a thrash metal kid growing up i listened to like pretty much i only listened to old shit and so i would go down rabbit holes into like all the different waves of thrash metal and nuclear assault for sure i i would stay up late watching like old interviews or uh you know the brainwashed music video or you know, listening to like handle with care. I mean, there's just, there's definitely some ignorant shit on like nuclear assault stuff that I would highly recommend. Oh, those are great records. There's a, Oh man. Handle with care is great. That's Uh, there's that one. Uh, there's a record. uh, I can't remember the name of it, but I just know that there's a song called hang the Pope. Yes. It's like hang the Pope with the roof. It hang the Pope. Um, so funny story about hang the Pope, um, year, probably 15 or so years ago. Um, Toxic Holocaust did a cover of Hang the Pope. They were on tour with the Black Dahlia Murder. That's why They played Rocket Town in Nashville, and they had picketers because of that song. Not even their song. That's amazing. Just just knowing that is like, ah, chef's kiss. So, yeah, I I became familiarized with Thrash and kind of diving deep into that history, knowing who Dan Lilker was through that. And then eventually, like maybe getting into more extreme versions of music later on, you know, I didn't really have much of a relationship with Grindcore like during that era at all. Probably not even until I left for Bowling Green, like my, maybe my, my first year of college. And it was definitely something I, I think I made a, uh, you know, decision in my head. And I'm like, I want to get into the, like, what are the classic records? Like, what are the classic grindcore right. records? And, you know, you fall on brutal truth, extreme conditions demand extreme responses. The album cover is just so striking that you're like, well, fuck, I don't know what this is, but I can't stop looking at it. And I'm sure this is crazy. Like. And so I, I got into it through that, but never really going too far into the band's like origin or maybe yeah. even some of the later records at all. I, I still really didn't know a whole lot. And a lot of uh, my knowledge now comes from maybe even just doing this episode. So that first record, uh, Extreme Conditions, is probably as close as they are as they got to traditional kind of grind, that old school earache sound. because. I mean, second album in, they're uh, they're throwing some curveballs at us big time. This is like, it's like kind of night and day. I will say there are definitely songs on here that are oh, straight ahead, yes. grind, death metal kind of yep. vibe. Probably four to five of them. Yeah, and but then there's like also like industrial and noise and even like some black metal stuff on this record yep. I even heard. Uh, um, yeah, so. I hope we agree on the same track. I I'm, think sure, it's, I'm sure we'll find it, but. Yeah. It's a it's a crazy right re- like it's for your sophomore record. This is pretty buck wild. Like this is crazy. Eric had all the bands in the early 90s, right? You had your classic bands. You had your Napalm Death, Carcass, Bolt Thrower. I mean, Morbid Angel. Geez, the, the list goes on. And I'm sure out of that is where, you know, signing to Eric made sense. Uh, Eric had Eric was at the forefront for a handful of years of grind death metal uh and and kind of a blending of those two and then you had this just great catalog of bands putting out these great records that were you know changing the landscape of what heavy music was from there on out and you know you you talk about kind of your forefathers of grind a lot of people are going to mention napalm death for obvious reasons carcass repulsion uh from detroit uh siege you know, all those bands like that and Brutal Truth, I don't think it's brought up quite 
as much, maybe because of the time that they were signed to Earache or the records. But this is a this is a big record. This is a big deal record. This thing is awesome. I'm glad that you brought up Earache because I don't think you would have this band in particular without a lot of those Earache no. bands. I mean, the sole reason that this band exists in a lot of ways is because Dan Loker was getting into extreme versions of music. I think I like, I appreciate and respect Dan in the sense that where a lot of those guys that came from maybe like the kind of old guard, maybe like the thrash metal scene where they kind of stayed in that kind of, I like what I like. I don't really need to like go that much further into this. That's not everybody, but you know, I don't even even have to name names. I think you could probably deduce maybe some guys who kind of stayed in their in their lane. They didn't really need to venture out. Dan Looker has like always been a champion of underground music and finding new extremes in heavy metal. He's just always done it. And he was there, you know, like pretty much at the ground floor of, you know, grindcore. Uh, I would there's a there's a quote in here. And I don't know if you would agree with it necessarily, but I'll, I'll run it by you where. He basically said that Repulsion probably invented grind or at least maybe paved the way for it in America, yep. but they probably didn't recognize that they were doing grind. They thought they were just playing death metal very fast, where Brutal yeah. Truth was kind of like almost like Black Sabbath and Judas Priest were like Judas Priest was the they were truly accepting of this is grind core or this is heavy metal rather. Correct. And we'll run with it kind of like where brutal truth is like we are fully a grindcore band and we are going to play grindcore so i yeah i could i could see that for sure you know if you in comparing those you know kind of setting the ground floor with repulsion which essentially was just kind of old school death metal you know a little bit more thrash metal maybe some hardcore influence in there uh and just figuring out how to make it sound faster those guys were probably listening to a lot of really uh heck what we would probably call power violence at this point you know, just really fast, intense stuff and just going, how do we how do we do this? Because I believe Repulsion's drummer's name was like Dave Grave. And they kept telling him like, oh, he, he created this kind of drum beat and he referred to it as like a cheat beat. But it was basically the one foot blast. And, you know, then years later, you get like uh, World Downfall from Terrorizer and Pete's like doing one foot blast the entire time and so on and so forth. but. I would definitely say that uh, from what I know about Brutal Truth and the little bit of knowledge I have, they definitely took the grindcore label and went, we're this type of band. We're okay with being this type of band. We're going to fuck around with it, but we're this type of band. I like the the uh, origins of this band is like very interesting to me. I think it really caught, I think that was like a lot of it that stuck out, like just how this band even came to be. So. Obviously, we've mentioned that Dan Lilker was in Nuclear Assault. He was still in Nuclear Assault when this band was, you know, in its for the early days, right? And so, from what I understand, Nuclear Assault was caught in the midst of like some label disputes. They were signed to this uh, kind of like more hardcore metal label called. Uh, in, in effect, right? Which mm-hmm. I think kind of spawned from maybe some people who worked at Combat Records. There's a whole, I think they even put, they put out like records by like Agnostic Run and like some some New York hardcore, maybe even Madball stuff. Um, but they were like a imprint label of Relativity, right? And so they were kind of, these labels were having some problems with the IRS. I don't know all of the details of like what was going on, but be that as it may it's it became such a uh, it took a toll on the band in general and it was just it was just kind of like a decline from that it became from what i understand more of like a business rather than an outlet for creating music so while this is occurring dan starts to get into more extreme forms of music so because the band was signed to in effect and uh, you know an offshoot of relativity they uh he had like a job at a distribution warehouse so the uh distribution center is called that or it was called important distribution so that they like did all the stuff for relativity they also did work for other labels including earache so 
Right. You know, they would hire like all these musicians to kind of just like work in the warehouse. Man. And so then you, you know, it's like Dan it's like Lilker, a fucking Monopoly. Yeah, 100%. So Danny and John Connolly, who was, I think, the very first vocalist of Anthrax, but also the vocalist of Nuclear Assault, they're working in this warehouse. And at some point, this is how Dan becomes familiar with Napalm Death. They get scum in there. And so there he hears go. that, blown away. He actually, find, they have the address, the band's address is in the sleeve of the record. And he like writes to him, kind of introduces himself and, you know, basically says like, oh, this is rad. I love it. And I'm sure they were familiar with who Dan was prior to that. And uh, at the time, also, Bill Steer was filling in for Napalm Death. And he writes back, hey, if you like this, you should check out my other band, Carcass. And he sends him a demo. And I think that's kind of how he gets introduced to all the earache bands. He's like, I want to do what the, the like, this is what I this is crazy. I have to start writing stuff like this. And I think he was living with his parents maybe while he wasn't on tour. Like if you're not home most of the time, you just like have a place to kind of, you know, put your crap and then, you know, fuck off for months at a time. He has like a, uh, I think a drum machine and maybe like a four track kind of like tape recorder. And he starts basically writing, you know, his version of grindcore. It's really telling to to know that it was it was pretty much that easy back then to go, oh, I really dig this record. Flip it over. Ah, address. Yeah. And just snail mail it. Right. And actually have contact with the band. Think about that slint record, you know, with the. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's the first thing that came to mind. <laughs> put put the parents address on the back of the record and yep. you'll just get mail forever. You know, that's going to like Louisville, Kentucky, whereas this was going to fucking Birmingham or, or something like that. And, you know, getting a response back of, oh, we know who you are. Uh, <laughs> hey, here's. I know what Reeky Future Faction sounds like. Yeah. Could you imagine what that demo sounded like? Oh, just just that carcass demo. Just disgusting. Filthy. Just nails in a bucket. Yeah, so Danny is like basically working on nuclear assault stuff, or maybe there's they're at kind of a weird place with all of the, uh, you know, behind the scenes business type shit. But he's you know having fun, listening to grindcore, recording stuff in his like home studio. Uh, I need to mention Jim Welch before we do anything because Jim is apparently a very important piece of like how Brutal Truth came to be. A key component. Yes. Uh, so Jim worked for Relativity Records. Uh, he was like a uh, maybe in the department that worked through tour marketing and promotion. Uh, he first met uh, Danny when he was in Nuclear Assault. They came by the offices because, again, he was signed to like an offshoot label. Right. Um, Welch eventually went over to Combat Records. It's funny. I, he signed COC to that label. Uh, he also signed a press and distribution deal with Eric. There so at some point. Sony kind of takes over combat, like all the financials and the operations, and they decide that they want to step away from metal and hardcore releases. So Jim being, that's like what he does. He steps away. And then because he had like made some connections with Eric, he starts to work for the stateside, you know, kind of iteration of Eric records. Uh, and because he knew Danny, they, I think they start to form like a friendship or like a relationship where they start hanging out. and. Seemed like over a lot of beers and a lot of weed, uh, Brutal Truth weed. was kind of born in, in some ways where Jim was like, hey, this doesn't sound like maybe something that you could do for nuclear assault. Why don't you just do this as a side project? Get, you know, get your demons out in a lot of ways, you know, like you got to get, get really, it all out, get it all out. Be a little if you want to be creative in this, you should pursue it. But it, it's clearly that it's not going to work for nuclear assault. I don't think they're going to want to do anything like this um so that he kind of pushed him to do that and he starts looking for other people and this band uh, i didn't know was initially formed as a three-piece right they, it was danny on vocals or dan yes, on vocals well actually uh, two vocalists danny was on vocals we also had scott lewis uh, who played in another band called uh santas or I, I think that's how it was pronounced um I don't know how they came in contact with one another, but uh, one of the quotes I saw was basically that he knew that Scott would want to play fast, crazy grindcore shit. 
And right. that way he was just like, yep, that's a must. I got to do that. Uh, but the one, co- one connection that I do know is Brent Gern McCarty, uh, who was a roadie for nuclear assault. And apparently Gern is a tie into a Steve, a Steve Martin joke, or at least like a part of the record where uh, Steve Martin had like a, you know, this is Steve Martin's like my stage name, but my real name is Gern Blanston. And it's on the record, Comedy is Not Pretty from 1979. Enough time has gone by and the audience has gotten a little more sophisticated. And uh, I'm going to go back and start using my real name. And I don't think people will laugh uh, when they hear my real name is Gern Blanston. (laughs) I'll be doing a show this fall on TV, the Gern Blanston show. Uh, A couple albums coming out. The first one will be just Gern. (laughs) Second one, simply Gern. Do a couple of movies. Uh, Gern goes to college. And, uh, That's some like deep cut shit. Where I'm that like, is, how the fuck? That is some it? old comedy shit. That yeah. is like first era or first season SNL like comedy. I've yeah. got uh, my mother has a copy of one of Steve's books from that era called Cruel Shoes. Oh yeah, like it's just it's literally like just reading this really silly poetry. It's weird. It's kind of like this record. It's just, I don't know if it, sometimes when I, I have a few of his records and I'm like, I listen to him like this guy is, he's just a weirdo and yep. he would not have existed in any other profession other than this. Right. It's, uh, but you know, speaking on the Jim Welch connection, uh, I believe that's how they met Kevin. I think that's how the connection came from there. Yeah. Eventually. So they get, so they get Brent. And they they would like be on tour, nuclear assault. They would like hang out in the back of the bus. Like everyone's asleep. They're listening to like Sepultura. They're like getting into the extreme stuff and just like smoking their brains out. And I think Brent had mentioned that he wanted to play in a band, like in guitar, like guitar in a band. He had that itch. He just like couldn't find anybody to do it. And then years later, Danny reaches out and was like, hey, I'm doing this thing. And I think he lived in Connecticut at the time. So he would like, come down to New York city and then they would practice together. Um, but the, on the, so it's the three piece on the, on the first demo. So you basically have Scott, you have Gern and you have Danny and Danny and Scott are the ones doing vocals on this record. Uh, and it was, it was actually, uh, produced or recorded by Glenn Evans, who I believe is the drummer of nuclear assault too. So they just kind of yeah. put it together. It's New York. It, send it out. Um, they played a few shows as this lineup, but playing at speeds like this and playing drums and guitar can be, you know, it's uh can be a battle. So they were like, fuck that. We need a singer. So who are we going to get? So Jim Welch, he suggests Kevin Sharp. Now, uh, Kevin was heavily involved in kind of the underground scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, he worked for the now defunct CMJ Music Journal and he uh, actually, I think a couple times it was mentioned, he covered the 1989 Grind Crusher tour in Europe, which featured Napalm Death, yep. Morbid Angel, Bolt Thrower, and Carcass. You know, basically just a huge fucking a, earache yeah, tour. An earache tour. <laughs> yep. Um, now, Kevin and Danny had actually met a few times before this. So it was kind of like they had kind of had an understanding of what they were about. Um, I read a thing in in this book, and I'll I'll mention this a little later. but. I think Kevin apparently would walk around with this Walkman like all the time. He just like had it and he had like the big like the big cans cans on and, you know, he would just carry it with him wherever. And I think one of the first times Dan Danny heard uh, in tombs uh, left hand path was like at a bar and he was just like, you got to hear this right now. Like and just put it on like (laughs) (laughs) this cannot wait. Um, We're at a bar. I'm scamming some chick, you know, (laughs) there's. (laughs) <laughs> Someone's rolling a joint in the corner and just, oh, yeah, now, there, there just you go. stop everything. Uh, Danny knew Kevin could sing, too. Uh, just through their brief interactions together, Kevin came over to Danny's house uh, to record vocals for like a bolt thrower-esque kind of song that he had put together on like the, like the, the tape recorder. And actually, this song like a tweaked version of it over time became denial of existence, which was featured on the debut record. So kind of some spawning there, but 
yeah, they had uh, Kevin join. I I don't know if this is correct or not, but from what I read, uh, they were they basically needed a singer because they were going to be playing Milwaukee Metal Fest and they didn't want to sing anymore. And so oh I'm God. pretty sure no pressure, either, either Kevin's first show or an early show that Kevin performed with the band was like in front of like a few thousand people. And it's like, yeah, all right, <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, no, no big deal. Uh, yeah, not not crap in my pants or anything over that one. <laughs> This is uh, at this point, this is basically just a side project. But like right. I mentioned, Danny's still in Nuclear Assault. He's kind of released. He really they released a demo under Brutal Truth, but they basically at some point take a break, um, you know, with all of this IRS shit going on with relativity and in effect, uh, they basically like, well, we'll step away from this. You guys can work out whatever you need to do and we'll just like work on our side projects. So. You know, Danny has brutal truth. I think a few of the other members have a few things going on, but the last few things that Danny essentially did were uh, like a maybe like a brief run of dates, like a European tour with mm-hmm. Slayer, and then they worked on another record. They basically self-produced the 1991 record out of order, and it produced a lot of infighting. There's a lot of drug do- drug use during the sessions. It was like pretty pretty rough stuff. Uh, during this entire time so sounds like a standard behind the music into the band or breakup of the band situation yeah. it was a lot going on and i think there was a tour that got offered to brutal truth in 92 uh it was campaign of musical destruction tour uh with cathedral napalm death and carcass oh and i think he kind of used this as Damn. a way to c- kind of cut the cord where it's yeah. like i'm gonna be gone for a few months so either that or like i guess you could probably find someone else so um, I think they got together and you just told me, you know, I don't think you, his heart wasn't in it. So if you're, if you're, if that's not what you want to do and you got this other thing going on that I clearly do have like some passion about still, I think it's time to maybe kind of split up and, and figure that out. So, um, he left the band, but he did like honor some commitments. I think they did play a couple of dates in Europe, uh, which, you know, says a lot, a lot about Danny, I think, but he did officially leave Nuclear Assault in 1992. Um, you know, Brutal Truth had already been playing out. I think it was starting to take on a life of its own. And then here we go. Now we're off to the races. Yep. 1992, you leave Nuclear Assault and then you join uh, and then you release your first Brutal Truth record. Uh, but yeah, it, it, you know, as you said, you're to the races. You know, you've sometimes life deals you a weird hand from time to time. And sometimes that hand is a winning hand. and uh, you know, Nuclear Assault was a uh, fairly successful thrash band. Uh, you know, sold a, you know, I think they had a gold record by this point, or probably not by this point, but they ended up with a gold record. Um, and Dan was like, you know, with all this shit going on, I've already got Brutal Truth kind of going. I've already got this this project that's already starting to make headway. I'm going to go and tour with these bands I like a lot. Um, I, yeah, I think I'm just going to bow out and go do this. Um, and it's not like, as you said, it's not like he went and just like split on the band and left them hanging. Like he honored all of those dates he had with them and went, all right, I'm, I'm good. I'm good to go. I think when they did the first demo, they attempted to like go to combat with it. And they were like, mm-hmm. hey, what do you think? What do you think of this thing? And they were like, you should take this to somebody that, <laughs> you know, I think this would better, like probably in a nice way, like this would be better served under a different name or something like that. And I think it was, I think Morbus record records or recordings. Uh, they ultimately released it. I think I read where maybe on like the back of it, it, it said liberated from combat records or something. Oh, like that. amazing. But they clearly were influenced by the earache bands. It only makes sense for this band to want to be with, you know, yeah. Other bands that are in the same kind of, you know, Weight class, I guess. Well, you said it, you know, they want to be they wanted to be with a label that understood what they were and how they needed to be promoted and the types of pr- tours they need to be on and, and that sort of thing. Because the last thing you want to do is be a band that wants to be, you know, a priority to a label. And then you, you know, maybe you do join a combat and they're putting you out there with like the accused or they're putting you out there with, you know, a reformed COC or anything like that, which 
great bands would be an interesting tour, maybe in today's mindset of like seeing those odd bands together. But, you know, in 1991, 1992, there still was a lot of separation between church and state when it came to uh, types of musical subgenres. So being on Earache with that, with already having the credentials they did just from like, when did Scum come out? 87? Uh, Something like that. You know, having credentials from Scum on to 91, 92, like, yeah, you, you've already built that catalog up of they know what they're doing, kind of. So they sent like a bunch of those demos to Digby at Earache overseas. And it, I think he was very gung ho to want to work with the band. I think Kevin mentioned that he and Digby had like been familiar with each other to some extent. They were like tape trading kind of early on. And I, I think maybe even Kevin had like a, a job through a record label, if not Eric doing some like kind of PR stuff, but it was, they, there were some connections there. So yeah, not long after that, they start working on extreme conditions, demand extreme responses, uh, which I found was a, uh, a, like a line from a UK band called test department or test dep. Uh, they had a record from 87 called good night out. Uh, very kind of, politically charged band i think they wrote maybe a song about um like a minor strike in england and they had a line in there that said extreme conditions demand extreme responses so kind of back pocket kind of thing like well, we should yeah. use this for a record cover or a record it's, title. Uh, that's the cover of that record definitely looks like a grind record just in color like oh, a lot okay. of like grind power violence all of that you know kind of that style uses a lot of black and white or scanned covers or anything like that, which is part of the charm. But seeing that as, oh, this looks like, this kind of looks like a graphic novel situation, but it's some of the most fucked up, like politically charged uh, images you could think of. Like if I, if I remember correctly, there's one clip on there that is a very malnourished child. Yeah. It's, it's like on a, the front of it. It's, it's pretty. Yeah. It's bleak. Yeah. It's a bleak. Bleak record cover for sure, which definitely I'm sure influenced a lot of future oh. records in oh, yeah. grindcore to yeah. kind of take on similar imagery and themes and everything. Being an earache band, I'm sure you can guess who they probably used to produce that debut huh. record. Hmm. I don't know. Uh he probably still produces records to this yeah. day. I who could that who could that be? Man. Who it, could it be? European Scott Burns. Colin Richardson? Was, Colin Richardson. Colin Richardson. Yeah. This was the guy at the time. I mean, by this point, I'm sure he had done many releases for Egg, Carcass, Bolt Thrower, Napalm Death, many, many more. Um, so you're gonna have you're gonna use him, no question about it. Um, the one thing that I found interesting, you know, I'm sure, you know, I think one por- important thing to mention about Colin is that, you know, kind of like Scott Burns, you learn how to these are like some of the first guys that really knew how to record bands like this, right? Correct. And some of the stuff that they did in order to make that possible is pretty pretty hilarious to to be truthful. Uh, I mean, Mick Harris putting a 50 pence coin uh where the the bass drum beater? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the the Vinnie Paul thing. Yep. Oh, was Vin- Oh, he did it too? Well, v- Vinnie Paul did it too, uh but it basically kind of allows the kick drum to sound like a trigger, which we're familiar with now. So like anytime you'd hear those Pantera records, it would like, especially probably up to far beyond driven. Uh, it sounded like he was using triggers. No, he would put like these huge coins on those things and just like hit them and it would make that sound. So that's funny. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, there was that, uh, Glenn Evans from nuclear salt also used to, uh, he used to use like square beaters too. So it just like, hits the the drum head kind of like head on. So I think that kind of helps shape the sound of this record in particular, just kind of knowing a few of yeah. those things. Um, but I think they released this record. I know they did some touring. Um, I want to say what, one tour in particular that kind of stuck out to me too, and I'm sure there's some connections otherwise, is that they they went on tour and they had like Fear Factory open for them. Colin, uh, Colin Richardson connection there. He did to manufacture. There he you sure go. did. He did their breakout record on Roadrunner. Interesting. So yeah, I wonder, I wonder if there was like any other things that kind of, I'm sure maybe they were familiar with each other, but yeah. So like one of those like very early tours for Brutal Truth, the Fear Factory. Uh, that would have been a what? 
again, that's a weird one. That's a weird yeah. tour. Uh, yeah. Early Fear Factory prior to the manufacture was very kind of grind influenced, kind of death metal influenced. Uh, Dino uh, has a lot of connections in the grind and early death metal world. He has a, he started the project Bruhuria. He started that project. Oh. He's also got a, yeah, that, that was Dino initially. Uh, oh, and then he started a project called Assassino years later. That was uh, again, like a um, basically all the members in there it had a bit to it. All the members in Asesino was were like, I believe they were Mexican drug cartel leaders or something like that. It was it was great. Like Dino's Dino's got a good connection in like the death metal world for sure. Uh, you do all this touring sometimes that people are not it's equipped. It's just to... not sto. It's just not good for everybody. It's true. I get it. So Scott, from what I understand, not not big on touring in, at this time. Uh, he leaves in November of 93, just before the recording of Need to Control. Um, they tried out a few drummers, though. Uh, one person in particular, Brandon Thomas of Ripping Corpse, which is okay. uh, definitely cool. New Jersey. They didn't go with Brandon. He seemed to be more of like maybe too much of a metal drummer, if that makes Probably sense. Probably like a thrash or old school kind of. Yeah. It just it, there wasn't the right fit. One person they did ask to audition, kind of similar in that New Jersey. Dave Whitty. How did we not know this shit? <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah, 100%. That, that would make perfect sense. He never actually auditioned for the band. They called him up. Danny called him up and asked him if he'd be willing to like help him out with the record. But uh, they, Human Remains had just signed to Relapse, and he was kind of like full steam ahead with, yeah. with everything that Human Remains was doing. So kind of interesting that that almost happened. I would have been curious to see how that would have turned out. I think if that would have happened, there'd been no, uh, probably wouldn't have municipal waste as long as you've got them now. Maybe, or at least uh, maybe, yeah, I don't know, depending yeah. on how that would have lasted for sure. I mean, you yeah. know, he's been in everything, though. Hey, God. Like, you, you, yeah, you would have we made could do an episode work. on him. Yeah, we, we, well, Ed, I wonder if we'll do that at some point. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was that was information I didn't know. What's great is you get... The Human Remains album or the EP, whatever you want to yeah. call it. Like you get that, you get that great like treasure out of all this. So you try some people out. It's not working out. Kevin Sharp goes to a show at ABC No Rio in New York City to see a band called Nine Finger, which features former at the time COC member Mike Dean. This is going to be Nine Finger's last show because Mike Dean is going to be moving back to North Carolina to rejoin COC. But Nine Finger drummer. Rich Hope, he needs a new gig. He needs a new place to kind of put his drums, play in a band. He wants to play in a band again. Now, the interesting thing here, making connections, Kevin Fisher, who plays in Buzz Oven, was also at the show, and he was hanging out with Kevin Sharp. He kind of understood the situation. He, know, he knows that Brutal Truth is looking for a new drummer. He knows that Rich Hope is also looking for a new band. They make the connection at the show, they exchange information, and they kind of set it up from there. Now, Rich Hoke, he auditions for this band a couple times. Uh, I think even on the second one, there was a quote of him saying that he was pretty sure that they probably ran out of time trying to find someone else <laughs> before they were supposed to record or go on tour. So that's very funny if, like, I mean, it's one of those things where you like, as a musician or someone who's creative, you're probably like, yeah, they probably just it's def, it's definitely not me like yeah. and he's a great drummer and we'll get into that a little yeah. bit, too. But it's just funny, like I got the job and I still can't even like, yeah, they're probably they were probably just like couldn't find anybody. And they're yeah. like, yeah, this guy's he's free. Like, he's fine. He's perfect. Rich didn't have much of a grindcore background. though. He did not. He was more into like uh, he was more into like punk and everything and like hardcore and everything. From what I read, he they had to he had to get used to doing a blast beat. Yeah, I think Danny was the one who showed him how to do like the two foot blast. It, like, Amazing. Yeah, he didn't he didn't have any sort of yeah he wasn't too familiar with like metal and grind and extreme music like that. Like I think even reading like he's like yeah when I listen to metal I'd probably go back to like Sabbath and stuff like that. Yeah. But I I didn't wasn't really familiar with like grindcore. Well, you go back. That's really reminiscent of the. I think it was the there's a story in choosing death about when Pete joined Morbid Angel. Uh, yeah. Pete had been playing with Terrorizer, knew how to do a one foot blast and play grind drums. 
He didn't really have a grasp on like traditional death metal drums. He didn't have his double kick down. <laughs> Trey and David used to play like, they used to play electronic drums to him and go like, listen to how fast this guy is. So Pete would be down in the basement of the house they shared in North Carolina, like blasting away. And then they just heard, they heard a, a sound and a stop. They all go down to the basement. He had passed out. Because it was so hot and he was sweating and he was drumming so hard oh, God. to learn how to do it. And it's like, perfect. Of course, it's like peer pressure to learn how to do a blast beat or something. But the fact that like Dan was like, here's how you do this. <laughs> here's how you do this drum thing. And I'm sure it was the same way. I don't know if Dan actually like plays drums or not, but I'm sure I think he he programmed a lot of stuff. He had a drum machine. I'm sure he probably did that and maybe showed him. I, I don't know ex- exactly, but that was kind of the thing we got to like kind of break him in. Like he's a good drummer. And actually they even mentioned like he had more of a, more of a swing like style, like style wise as a drummer. That's hilarious. Uh, So again, I think kind of like we were talking with, Oh man, who did we talk with? Like, like Sivaris for instance, right? Some of those guys didn't really even have like a background in this sort of extreme music, like, or like the, the extreme music that they're putting out. Like some of those guys are jazz guys or like yep. more hardcore guys. And then they're putting out some of like the most like crazy death. Intricate doom shit. Death metal, yeah. yeah. So, and maybe that's a testament to this record too. Maybe only these guys could have really made this record. I like how you use the phrase of breaking him in. Yeah. Because that's how we segue to the, uh, essentially the pre-production and, oh boy. and, and writing of this record. It's like, what can we do to break rich in? Let's go to New Hampshire in the middle of February with no AC and just use this. uh, It's essentially a shed on the property of uh, Gern's like sister and his and her husband, like just on their property. And they're like, we'll stay in there. We're not going to charge anything. So they have to, they're going to be going on tour. We'll we'll mention that in a little bit. They are going to be writing a new record. We have to get, oh, so we, it's like, all right, we're going to go up to this, like, I think it was like a kind of a summary town. Um, if I remember right in my notes, uh, Lake, Lake Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire. And what's and, it famous for? Uh, <laughs> what about Bob? Yes. This film here. Which that is one sense. of the first movies my girlfriend and I watched together. Really? Do you remember the, uh, the Bowling Green tornado that hit the end of 2021? Yeah. It happened, and then it snowed like the next day. I'm sure there's nothing. There's nothing concerning about that. No, 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 no. 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 We were stuck. Extreme conditions demand extreme responses. Yeah, right. Um, Um, (laughs) We were stuck in the house, and we were just like, "What are we gonna watch?" I was like, "Shit, I haven't watched What About Bob in years," and I laughed out loud for like an hour and twenty minutes. God damn! But now all I'm gonna hear is grind playing in the background of that shit. So. Very summery movie, if I'm not mistaken, because I'm sure it looks beautiful to shoot in the summer. Their idea was like, okay, well, we need a place that no one's going to be around. We're not going to be fucked with. Let's go up here. Gern's got a sister uh, who's got a place up there. <laughs> but we're going to go like, yeah, in the dead of winter. Like, I think, yeah, it was like January, February of uh, fucking like 94. And we go in the dead of winter in New Hampshire just to really like, Again, get the live set down. We're going to write shit and we're just going to like kind of get him up to speed on like what we think this should sound like. And when I mean it was cold, it was cold. <laughs> I, I read a story on, on the book where it was like propane tank that they had with like fucking freeze or something. That like doesn't that. happen normally. Like, yeah, that's man, that's cold. I mean, uh, I think it's in the Hall of Fame portion where. They're talking about sleeping in in the practice space and the room Dan was staying in was so poorly built that, or maybe it was just falling apart, that they would have to put plastic up on the wall to keep the air out of it. And that if you if you breathed inside of your um, sleeping bag too much, you would wake up and there'd be frost all on the inside of your sleeping bag from the, the moisture. How, how did they, uh, and then to also have to write a record kind of, how do you do that? Like it, again, extreme conditions, <laughs> man, they were, you know, good and well, they were hot boxing that shed the entire time and just eating probably the cheapest shit they could get from the grocery store. Top ramen, 
I saw uh, because it was so frigid. One of the things that Danny mentioned was that this was like uh, his first introduction to Immortal without even having to listen to him. It, it already was just Frim and <laughs> just grim and frostbitten. He said he listened to Immortal and then he was like, yeah, some black metal influ- influence uh, like kind of snuck into Brutal Truth a little bit after this. So uh, there was another story where Rich drove a van an hour away to like another town in New Hampshire just to pick up an ounce of, an ounce of weed during a blizzard. Like Amazing. Priorities. Which, yeah, which we should mention. There is a lot of weed. Weed definitely sponsored oh, this record. This Weed sponsored this band. Yeah. This oh, is 100%. like... This is like Cephalic Carnage before Cephalic Carnage was a band. Because, like, they're the Rocky Mountain Hydro grind. Speaking of weed, they would basically, like, wake up, do bong hits, and, like, bond over cable TV. And apparently one of the programs that they were very much into was Coach. Which, (laughs) you know, Craig T. Nelson. I don't know, maybe people remember Poltergeist and The Incredibles. But Coach. Not only Craig T. Nelson, but you've... But you've got uh, you got the future Patrick Starr on there as well. Oh shit! Yeah, that's right. He, the big blonde guy. Yeah, yeah, big blonde guy. <laughs> I think he's blonde. He's, he is. I, I think he. Um, I don't know why. I know, I, I, I watched a little bit of How I Met Your Mother. He's uh, the the big one's dad. Real. That's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. I just re- I remember being a kid and I would just go, "Why does he sound like that?" Not really. <laughs> Not realizing he's like, he's got a little CTE, probably <laughs> a, little, a little slow. He uh, so the, the the great part about this is like they would stop rehearsal every day, like every like at four thirty, like clockwork. It's like to watch a new stop, episode of Coach. Stop, we it's Coach is on. <laughs> I gotta watch. I gotta watch my stories. I don't even know what I could compare that to. Maybe like slayer used to end their practices by going to tgi fridays no way i never they, heard that that's they, awesome they, yeah they'd all go to a tgi fridays and just watch the game like that was wanna, the- <laughs> i just want to watch Kerry king try to eat mozzarella sticks that's like all those all those spikes they get in the way <laughs> there's there's two noise tracks on this record uh iron lung and crawl space and they were recorded on danny's like eight track uh cassette like a how do you say it? Like Probably like a Tascam or a DAT Ta- or something yeah, that's like it. that. Yeah, um, so they just like fucked with it. And I think they mixed it down later on a DAT tape. Like yeah. when they were actually in the studio. But So I don't know about um, I don't know about Iron Lung, but I know Crawl Space in particular was like the rest of the band went out to like go grab groceries or something like that. And Dan was alone. And it's like eight tracks of high volume highly distorted bass and he's literally standing in front of the amp like letting the bass <laughs> feed back in front probably no earplugs nope. just like going for it he goes it was so loud it started to disorient him it made him sick and he was like it messed with him for days because it throws your volume will throw your equilibrium off after a few days and he's like yep it's probably the most painful thing i've ever done do it for the do it for the record hey I man guess. when when you're like all right they're gonna be gone like an hour and a half because you know they they're, they're going to get they're going to get whatever they can and steal the rest um and they're probably going to grab a sack of pot or something on the way back just so we can like sleep you know i got time to do this and like probably knocked it out in 10 minutes and he's like i guess i'll just watch a rerun some murder she wrote <laughs> <laughs> i knew they I, Matt Lock. <laughs> I knew they had uh they had a, like at least a good chunk of the record kind of already written before rich was in the band. So they had like four or five songs. And then I think they hashed out the rest of it during this like trip. That's still 10 songs. <laughs> yeah. <it's still> 10 <laughs> I think even the, the, the actual title for the record kind of comes from some of that, like experimental, like industrial stuff that Danny's doing. He apparently was like making these like 30 second industrial pieces and he would just like say random shit into the recorder and somehow like need to control came out of that. And he mentioned uh, Neil Pert at the end of 2112 yes. doing some like kind of crazy That's shit. Right. While, you know, there's like a wall of all this chaos it's, going shit's down. Shit's falling apart. Yep. Yeah. A hundred percent. So. You know, hey, man, that's, uh, <laughs> that's 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 an old school. That's an old school thing he was doing there. That's cool. Because like I know. 
for some reason, like those early anthrax that that first anthrax record, for some reason I've read interviews regarding that and like Rush was brought up a lot. So like of course it would be, you know, some of his formative years. I mean shit, they did a thing even a handful of years ago. They covered Rush on a They like sure a, did. They that's, did a covers EP or whatever. That's so, right. Yeah, that those 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 guys are nerds. Like historically they're nerds. <laughs> yeah. Um, so after this kind of time away, they come back. Uh, they recorded the album in March of 1994. Um, you have, you know, kind of a, a variety of people working on the album. Steve McAllister is an engineer. Colin Richardson is mixing the record. The record was co-recorded uh, with the band and some of these engineers at uh, Baby Monster Studios and Platinum Island Studios in New York. Uh, now, Baby Monster was a recording studio uh, founded by, I think, a session guitarist by the name of uh, Steve Berg. Uh, he has like credits with Jimi Hendrix, Gladys Knight, John Prine, Willie Nelson, Billy Joel. Um, I think people who recorded at Baby Monster, like the Ramones, Amy Lou Harris, Cypress Hill. Uh, also, the debut record that this band did was also recorded at Baby Monster. And I think they got a deal on that first record because the the like the studio was actually like in the process of getting built so they were like yeah like you can record here they gave the label a deal so they were just like yeah absolutely 100% so they they did their it was like one of the first recordings they ever did at baby monster was extreme conditions that's that's phenomenal because seeing the names that have had have done work there since that first record's like god they Somehow they put this band in with all of those big names, like a studio that was done by those big names. You know, that's uh, in today's age, that's unheard of because you can record something truthfully anywhere now. Sure. Uh, but, you know, the the era of the big studio is kind of gone. But knowing that, hey, uh, we've got credentials such as Gladys Knight, Cypress Hill, Billy Joel and Brutal Truth. Our first recording was Brutal Truth. Yeah, that's pretty Who? crazy. Well, let me give you a story. Right. And it's like, yeah, it was just started by a guy, like maybe like former hippie turned studio owner. Yeah, sure. You guys can come in here, set up shop. Go for it. Ah, uh, you, those young kids. <laughs> six foot, six foot eight, Dan Loker, or however tall he is. They record the record, but they didn't mix it like directly after. Like, you know, I'm not familiar super familiar with like how the recording process is, but I would assume that most bands, they record the record, they get right into mixing and mastering. Usually you send it off to mix, but you know, different groups have done different things. Some bands want to be there for the mix. Some bands don't. Um, kind of going way back in the riff worship cat or, uh, caveat here. But uh, when we talked about Injustice for All, um, I mean, the the mixing for that was tedious because they were flying back and forth while they were on tour. So, again, that band wanted to be there for the mixing. Uh, some bands don't mind. They're like, if they know who's mixing it and they know what that is going to sound like, they're cool with it. But what I definitely grasped on this album was the band wanted it mixed a certain way. And there was a lot of back and forth and maybe even some head butting and some like head shaking in particular. Um, but it was uh, there was some time in between the recording and the mixing for sure, uh, and that may have been caused by some of the earache stuff we're going to talk about later on. Like we mentioned before, going up to the New Hampshire, like the house, they had like a tour plan. They were booking a tour with uh, Pungent Stench and Chicago's Macabre. Um, the label was not about this. Digby did not want them to go on tour. They wanted them to basically do the record first, and then that way they would have something to kind of promote while they were on tour. The band didn't give a shit. They wanted to like go on tour with like bands that they, you know, liked and they, they had a, had a good time with, uh, they were doing things for themselves. I think they had already, you know, or at least Danny having dealt with labels, you know, for quite some time. Yeah. He was just like over maybe being told what to do or like how to do things a certain way. It's just like, yeah, no, this sounds fun. I'm going to, I'm going to do this shit. And so they basically went on tour with Pungent Stench and Macabre for nine weeks, all three bands living in a double decker bus. That happens a lot in the UK and Europe. They'll, they'll rent one of those large double deckers. Yeah. 
and they'll put two or three bands in those things. Buses in the States are typically like you got six to eight bunks. Uh, so over there in a double decker bus, everybody's in a prone, like captain's chair, just <laughs> sleeping or whatever. That had to be pure chaos. I, I mean, just I, even the description of it. So it was like the, imagine the bottom part of the bus mm-hmm. is like mostly filled with gear. They have like a small lounge in, in part of that, mm-hmm. but they're all, they're basically all four. I'm assuming all forced upstairs because that's where all the bunks are. Yeah, there's some sunlight coming in up there, but I just I don't know. I've never been on a double decker bus, so I don't I I can't like. Yeah, I can't say for sure. But the smell. What's that? What did that cop say to you? Like a bag full of mashed up assholes. (laughs) Just a bag of mashed up assholes on a double decker bus for nine weeks. They finish it. And so, uh, you know, it's time to mix the record. But Eric only wants to pay for two members to stay in England. You know, you got to put these guys up. So <laughs> you would tight I, wads. when I was reading this, I was like, well, surely like Danny is going to stay, uh, you know, maybe Kevin. Uh, they actually have Kevin and Rich stayed to mix yeah. the album. You have Kevin and the new guy sticking around to mix the album. Danny goes to Germany, I think. He goes to a different part of Europe to uh, rec- play on a Holy Moses record. Oh, my God. And then Gern returns to the States to just be with family. So they do that whole thing, uh, and it's co-mixed at Par Street Studios by the band and Colin Richardson, which... Another expensive fucking studio. Yeah, this was a studio that was previously owned by the band Genesis. My God. Yeah. I don't know if they owned it at the time, but it was at one point they owned the studio. I I think in in the Decibel Hall of Fame, Kevin was stated as saying... It costs like a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars a day for Fuck. them to work there. They did, uh, they did work on Cold Plays, a rush of cold blood to the head, and I saw that and was like, that is so funny to me to see yeah. like one end of the spectrum, and here we are talking about a completely just foreign opposite end of the spectrum. They like apparently we're gonna like demo this place in '06, and then they kept it around. They were like. Oh, well, it's still a recording studio, but we got like a hotel. It's like a resort kind of thing. Bars now, isn't and it? office. Well, now it's they moved. So they actually oh, moved okay. the recording studio more more so recently within the past few years. Um, and I think they're they've been trying to like apparently turn it into more um, housing or something, which I think they were yeah. trying to like demolish, demolish it again, basically, like within the past few years. I don't know if they've actually done that, but the recording studio itself has actually like moved out of the of, of the building. But yeah, like it's it's pretty crazy to think that like, hey, brutal truth, need to control, mixed here, cold play also too. <laughs> you mentioned like Rich going to uh staying over and like working on the record and mixing it. Um that the conversation about what the album's release was going to look like. And I thought this was so fucking interesting that he was a fan of the uh kind of I guess those are I guess those are power violent style bands. You're far more familiar with that than I am. Bands such as Man is the Bastard, Spaz, uh, they were releasing these albums that would have these different sized records and and so on and so forth. Yeah. And he was like, it would be really cool to do our release with like a nine, eight, seven, six, five inch record. It yeah. looks cool, but I would lose my mind yeah, yeah. attempting to play that. And just go, God, just come out with something easier. Yeah, I think there's like, they had like a box set where it was just like, yeah, we're just going to, we're the most extreme band. Why don't we just like do some crazy packaging for some of this shit for sure. Even back then, it probably cost twenty five fifty or something. <laughs> and like today's dollars, that's 75 bucks. You know, what? the other thing that's like pretty striking about this record is the artwork. Oh my God, it's great. The first, the debut record is like certainly extreme looking and like it catches your eye. This is also like very unconventional. It's a very unconventional piece of artwork for a very unconventional record. It makes me think of, I never got a chance to play them, but the silent Hill games. Oh, interesting. It makes me kind of think of that. It also makes me think of a, there's a floor album. That's got this really up close shot of a face. It's kind of done in the same color scheme. Makes me think of that a little bit. Uh, I, I, from the moment I saw this artwork as a kid, I loved it. I was like, oh, yeah. this is this is awesome with like 
the head down on the ground. I'm assuming it's someone praying or it may not be, but you've got kind of the blood dripping down on the side of it underneath the logo. I thought it's a great, I think it's a great yeah. cover, but oh, it's, it's very perfect. striking. You notice it immediately. And what happened to the artwork, Austin? Earache lost it twice. I, I wonder how this happened. I don't think this was mentioned in my reading, but you actually do have the Decibel magazine, as you mentioned before, from 2006 that kind of covers the Hall of Fame induction. They didn't have this for me. Like, I, I can't get a back, shoot, back issue of this. It's like out of print. It's not available digitally. Did they cover how it got lost? They didn't cover it. No one ever really figured out how it got lost, but uh, Kevin has a really good description of it. He's like, yeah, a couple people just went to the label and we asked them. They're just like, oh, no, we can't. Ooh, <laughs> it's gone. So I, uh, how, how? Yeah. Like how mismanaged I, was that label? I wonder if that was the original then. Do you think that's like the original piece or did they have something else? God. Perhaps? I hope it wasn't the original. If it was the original piece and they lost it twice, yeah. it definitely means it's gone. <laughs> yeah, I just I wonder if the, they had maybe like a another thing in mind. They were just like they had to go with this. I, I didn't I didn't really find anything on that in my reading, but I I think this was the original piece. I, okay, again, I would be interested to find out if this was the original choice for the artwork, right? Um, because based off of it, the artist Louis Gazik, I looked to see if he'd done really anything else. This is it for like artwork for like bands. Really? This this it, is as far it. as like metal metal bands. Yeah, go? yeah, like this is this is the only thing I could find, uh, which is cool. Like this isn't necessarily like considered classics are kind of described differently at this point in time. Like you know, there's always going to be a hellbent for leather, a master of puppets, and so on and so forth. But then you go down a little deeper. Like this is a classic for the genre, but it's not one of those highly regarded classics like that. Uh, it, in that sense, it's not like. You know, Eddie Trunk isn't like touting about this record on his radio show. Oh, you know, it's, well, no, it's not. It's a classic. It's, to it's us. not one of the many versions of Rat that are still. <laughs> it's not the 2015 Rat record. It's a regarded classic to the subgenre. It's a great record, but it's wild to me that that artist was like, no one's ever, no one else has ever reached out to that artist and was like, yeah, sure, we'd love to do something else. I love that Brutal Truth record you did. Would we be able to get something? And who knows. It would be interesting to find out. So we've talked a lot about the back history of this band. We've talked about the formation and all the things that happened to get to where we are. Uh, we've wasted enough time. Let's get into the actual contents of the record. Collapse. What a first first thought. Sounds like Godflesh. Yes. You right know what? That's fucking funny. Gate. I never even made that connection before. You just said it now. 100%. Yes, there's definitely some God flesh on here. Just pummeling and trance like just just sound. It sounds like a collapse. It sounds like a city burning. Like, yeah, yeah, like a collapse, like a city burning. Even those. I don't think that's a sample. That's a guitar making those like police siren noises. Sure. I mean, it literally. That's so yeah, fucking cool. It's so it's noisy. It's industrial. I almost thought it sounded like a storm, too, is what yeah. I wrote in my notes. Uh, there was someone definitely throwing shit like around, oh. like it's cans or trash cans or something so like that. So that's got to be that reference to uh, Kevin and Colin kind of getting in an argument about the production. So Kevin would be like, dude, let, let's just do whatever we can to put on this record. You know, I want to break glass and knock trash cans over. And Colin would be like, why does that make sense? <laughs> like, and he would just shake his head. So like, that's, that's hilarious. And I'm so glad that like you pointed that out. What we didn't mention. And I, I didn't bring up talking about the weird production and mixing. John Zorn was originally on oh, par to do this record. That makes so much sense. And he just, he, he volunteered to do it. He's like, guys, I want to do this record. And it finally got to the point where he went back to them. He's like, guys, I'm so sorry. I'm so booked up and busy. I I'm sorry. Just go ahead without, without me. Whoa. That makes so much more sense. That would have been one amazing. Oh Obviously, my God. like John Zorn being like very much rooted in like the the noise and avant garde. Uh, you know, John Zorn has like all these connections with like Godflesh and Napalm Death. Uh, I mean, fucking painkiller was John Zorn, Mick Harris. Uh, I want to say even is it Justin Broderick? Justin Broderick was like at least on a a, a few releases by this band, but that's. I would have loved to have heard like this. God. That makes so much more sense. 
why if like you would like head tiered it to like a John Zorn who's like very yeah like uh experimental i would say he's like oh 100 it, it would that i sort of think thing. this album would have even been more experimental with someone like him oh like the, don't get me wrong the the production they spent time on this production like it sounds for a 94 like grind record it sounds really good it, it really does it, it, it it's it's mixed very well i mean it has to be right because there's yeah. it's so chaotic and there's like <laughs> so many so different things going on it. there's for a minute, a couple of the songs on here are a minute, minute and a half long. For that, there's so much shit crammed into one of those songs, like in the best way. And it's like, God, I can hear everything. I think this track alone for sure showcases that where you have like very dissonant sounding guitars. You have yeah. like this riff that just kind of drives over and over. Very industrial kind of sounding influence as well. You're a grind band. We're like, got to release our second record. What do we start it with, out with? A four and a half minute dirge. You know what? Uh, the other thing that really stuck out to me was Kevin's vocals. Are He's nuts. got an interesting grasp of like, and you, you catch it especially in this track and the track right after it too yeah. with like these weird kind of vocal things. He's got this, he's kind of using this fry kind of sound at the beginning of it where it's more spoken word kind of stuff. It's so deep though. Yeah. You know, it reminded me of, and I don't know if you remember this, Aladdin. There is Cave a, of Wonders. The Cave of Wonders. It yeah. sounds exactly like <laughs> the Cave of Wonders. It's so fucking deep. Invaders, you have touched the forbidden treasure. Now you will never again see the light of day. But he also has these highs that he is able to do. So he's got he's the full package, man. Like if this track doesn't show it like, yeah, Kevin's fucking awesome. If you listen to this track on headphones too, someone is definitely ripping a bong. 100%. Yes. Oh, 100. Oh, uh, yeah. It's not the only yeah. track that happens in no, either. No, not at all. No. Yeah, oh, so oh, I heard that immediately. It's like kind of it's, <laughs> it's buried in there a little bit. A, a you little just hear bit. the water churning? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, it's like bubbling up. It's like in your brain. Like I'm like, oh, somebody is like up against the mic, just just ripping a bong. No question about it. The first. I don't know anything I about that, mom. I'm sorry. I know everything about it, Mary. I'm sorry. Um, the first time I ever heard a bong rip on a track was on Mastodon's Remission. And I think it's at the end of Old Nessie. It's, it's, it's clean. There's nothing over it. But it's someone just ripping a bong right into a mic. And it's Fucking like amazing. Perfect. Perfect. Black Door Mine. Uh, this is probably the first, this is the first track on the record. You go, Oh, it's a grind band again. Yeah. Um, but this is, I kept reading this. I kept reading the title of this track is like, are they covering our fucking doors track? <laughs> Which I was like, is this backdoor man? Oh, backdoor man. Okay. I was like, Jesus. Um, but it's definitely not. And you mentioned Kevin's vocals on the first track, which shows a different kind of range, but this is like, he's got those crazy highs that he does toward the end of it. That's like, a very distinct sound that is very typical to the grind subgenre. Um, like it's it's a grind track. It's as fast as a grind track, but it just it has this dissonant edge that's all over the rest of the record. But it's also not just typical. Like here's 16 power chords played really fast. It's there's death metal shit all throughout that's played. There's intricate stuff played all throughout this track. Definitely, I, I think the best thing about going from track one to track two is that it it's like oh yeah it's a dirge and then you get like punched in the chops like almost out of the gate with how fast that tempo is for sure which you know is funny because i think i remember danny saying in some of my research that uh the bpm you know it, it, maybe it is like I, i'd have to compare again but like the BPM compared to the first record is slower because you essentially have a guy who has only been playing right grind drumming for like maybe less than a year, let's say. 
And I, I think it, it's a good contrast from going from the first track into the second track. I really like it. It segues really well. Um, again, you follow that up with another grind track. The the bass intro is great. I when I've heard this for the first time, I thought this had more of like a direct like punk uh, hardcore influence, just the way it sounded. Yep. Um, Rich is going fucking ham on this. There is like a random horn or somebody oh. saying something. It cuts out and it's just like whoop or like. <laughs> <laughs> Like there's, what are we? There's stuff happened? like that all through this record. It happened multiple times on this listen where I was like going through the 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 album where I like had to like stop what I was doing and I'm what like, what am I hearing? What is happening? I can only imagine listening to this for the first time on like vinyl and being like, what? Now I mean, now you know I'm, you know I got the the technological marvel of a of a phone or whatever. <laughs> I can go back. I'm like, what is happening? I still can't even quite discern what it is. Wait a minute. What did I just hear? That's that's what's enjoyable about this record. And it really caught me just in the first couple tracks is like, I'm going to hear shit on multiple listens that I didn't hear at the beginning. And these guys intentionally did that just to like, what can we do? Um, this is also the track where I in- immediately like said to myself, this isn't just a standard grind record. There's a lot more going on. Uh, and then you go into arguably uh, okay. I guess the band's single, single. <laughs> uh, and it's one of the weirdest tracks on the record. It, I, uh, absolutely. God player. More, more of an in- industrial influence track. Yep. There are insane tones and noises on this. I, I wrote didgeridoos. Yeah. You got like this didgeridoo drone by Andy Haas. Uh, I, I believe it's pronounced um, there. Yeah. There's some wild fucking sounds on this track. There's some helmet style riffs in this track, like the stop and start kind of riff with the the dissonance. It's very helmet like, very kind of early '90s stomp and start kind of um, kind of amphetamine. I've used that a lot, the kind of amphetamine reptile style stuff there. Uh, totally, I, I would I totally agree with that. It's very like atonal, like it's so weird 100%. sounding. Uh, the bridge in this song is th- there's some there's some great riffs. The, There's the, some really the, great the, riffs in this. The riffs in the song, the bridge in this song is one of the coolest oh, fucking with things the, on the whole record. The lead, like kind of lines that the entire they, it's like an it's it's a massive bridge in this song, and it's weird and like there's all these affected like. Uh, the bass is doing this weird thing in the background and there's these lead lines and it's it's chaotic as fuck. Like it's so weird and it just ends. Yeah. Yeah, those lead lines are like they de- they stick out, right? Cuz it's like, you know, there's like some effects definitely driving those uh those like melodic lines, but it, yeah, it sounds like you're fucking having a mental breakdown with some of that shit. <laughs> it's so funny. It's like it's funny too cuz this yeah, this has the I guess this is maybe considered the single just because yeah. you know, it has the music video and you know that like is getting some airtime in some capacity maybe on MTV <laughs> uh, MTV Europe. Yeah, they have um they had the I don't know if they still have it but they had like the Guinness no, not the Guinness Book uh-huh. of World Records shortest music video. I, I think years later I do believe that um I think Napalm Death or Earache did a video for You Suffer and it was a kid dancing. It was just gotcha. like and they're just gone. Yeah. Cuz I mean this is only like a few seconds. What is it? Collateral damage? Yep. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, and it's like probably I don't know. It's like a bunch of different, just random frames, like within yeah. a short amount of time. Buckwild, buckwild shit. Yeah, great, great track. Lots going on here. Lots of different textures. I I almost said like this sounds like a fucking door stopper being plugged into an <laughs> amp because it's like it's got like such a warbly kind of thing. Uh, again, it could be misinterpreted as another type of bong. I mean, it it goes right into uh like noise like almost at the end too it's like yeah. just descends into complete and utter madness before going into i see red um which i there's a few time or maybe maybe more but like there's definitely a lot of like phaser use on this record yes a lot and a lot of phaser a lot of like possibly even some flange kind of thrown in there for sure 
the riffs are great. I think this has like definitely a more straightforward death metal influence with yep. some of the riffing on here. Um, there is like a couple instances throughout this record as well where there's just random samples, like we mentioned, like sometimes it'll say something. I think someone's saying like back up on here, but I, I couldn't tell because it's just quick. It's there's like, a couple in the last couple tracks in here I can't wait for us to talk about. Definitely. I, I kind of want to bring up, sorry, on I see red a little bit is uh this is where I heard the immortal influence, the intro. Oh, sure. I kind of like lo-fi and I was like, that's definitely like some black metal kind of like it sounds like Abbott's guitar playing to me. That very kind of fried and like really um kind of articulate right hand he's got. That's where I heard that. And it kind of segues a little bit into there a little bit, but you're right. This is definitely like this is a death metal track for sure, just in grind pace. Uh, has that great groove at the end, has like a mosh part at the end, um, but it does go to the first noise track, which kind of breaks up the record a little bit. Uh, tell me what your interpretation of this song was, if you if you had any notes on it. Sounds like Mario Mario stepping on people's heads, I, killing them. I thought, I did think it was like video game sound. Yeah. I thought it sounded like Kirby noises with some of the shit. Hey, yeah. hey, that's good. I, I literally wrote in there, I was like, because I grew up playing like Kirby 64 and some of those like handheld ones. I was like, this sounds like some video game sound effects, at least for the first little bit, because yeah. then it just like turns into bubbling muck, which I'm sure you're, you know, with your gut, you're very familiar with. But. <laughs> 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 um it's uh yeah i i if, uh, if you could call it that a, a palate cleanser yeah 100 um, percent. In, in a way it's it's very unsettling shit and it's like four and a half minutes long but it does break up the album in a way mm -hmm. before you get into another just pretty like straightforward grind track you kind of you're sitting with this noise and it transitions right into bite the hand which i thought had a very Again, straightforward grind kind of style of riffing. There's like a lot of these like hammer and pull off riffs. Yeah. And then at one point, this is the track I actually noted where I, I kind of started to get a sense of like the black metal influence on here. There are some chords that happen very briefly. It happens like one fucking time. It's probably why I then, missed it. <laughs> and then and goes away. And I was like, oh, there's some like weird. It's it's like towards the end of the song. And then, yeah, you just never hear it's it. It's just again. gone. This is. um. This track opens up with a really great with Rich doing a really great like one foot blast. It's just like, oh, yeah, that's old school like that. That sounds like that kind of repulsion drum beat right there. But yeah, I heard that was just like, God, this is they're, they're blending it enough that the sequencing of the record's weird in a, in a strange way, but it's so well done. And, and it, it like, here, oh, here's a random grind track and we're going to dial it back. <laughs> I like that you mentioned that. It feels very like spontaneous. I mean, the whole record's very spontaneous with, you know, I've never really gotten into noise, um, but noise to me feels like more or less like a kind of reactionary type of form of music. It's very just spontaneous and like relies more on improv, I guess. This record definitely feels like a lot of like, and maybe it, maybe it lends to some of the, the backstory where it feels like every part of this band's existence is very much like kind of like see to your pants, like especially, you know, you get a drummer, you immediately have to go on tour and immediately have to start writing stuff. So maybe that kind of is a testament to just we got to come up with something and this is it. So a lot of the I like that you brought that up about the the sequencing where maybe it doesn't necessarily have a rhyme or a reason to it, but I think it fits as far as like. Absolutely. It's kind of just very chaotic all the way through this next track oh yeah might be my favorite track on the whole record honestly i th I said the same ordinary madness and really I, I think it's just because it's like the sludgiest it, kind of snail doom track in my notes i have this is the swindle track this is the so he would have liked this he would have loved this a Wherever nasty got, just distorted bass riff introing it and then the band comes in on it. it's like oh yeah this is old this is black sabbath uh it's going at a snail's dick pace and you got Kevin just screaming like the way that uh, the the riff itself goes and sometimes even cuts out yeah. like you hear it and it'll cut out and it's just mainly focused on Kevin's vocals and the and the riff. Uh, awesome. Awesome fucking way to 
write uh, this particular song uh it's got solos kind of it does it does it fucks it fucks like a dad in a guitar center picking up a fucking sg <laughs> like i heard that and was like there we go that's the rock and roll moment somebody was just like hey gern just go fucking wild. go for it go fucking nuts there's <laughs> like ape shit there's some like wild effects on that like lead i i noted in here with the the solo this band would have fucking loved an Earthquaker Rainbow Machine because there's like some tones some, that are just it feels exactly like that pedal was made for one thing and it was just a make fucking weird noises. There's no other rhyme or reason to it. A three hundred dollar pedal just to annoy everybody and it fits. God damn this. Yeah, I just I was so happy with this track and it, it's what's funny is it's followed by a cover. Yeah, which is a it's a great cover because it literally just sounds like Brutal Truth covering the germs. Media Blitz uh, with a very special guest. Yes, we're going back to New Orleans. There you go. We we tried. We, we, we tried. tried our best. Mike Williams. Isn't it crazy that Mike Williams is the most intelligible person on this track? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? I was going to bring that up. He sounds the best here he's ever yeah, sounded. 100%. I'm like. Hey, wow, I, he, he's the one I can hear. Like, I can kind of make out what he was saying. You know, we're so used to hearing those, like, southern accents. It's like, oh, yeah, I can comprehend everything now. Um, but there's a great story about him recording this track. And it's like, yep, Mike's a friend of ours. He arrived at the studio, did lots of drugs, smoked a lot of pot, drank some whiskey, knocked it out in one or two takes, and he was gone. <laughs> yeah, he's just around while they were recording the record. It's crazy. What a great guest spot on the vo- on the track of, like, it's almost like they just did the germ song just to get him on it. Oh, I would love that. I know there was like a connection later. They'd covered sister fucker part one and two for a tribute show for I hate God after Katrina. And it was the first time the band had gotten back together. That definitely. Yeah. So it was like uh, another, I'm sure they knew each other before, obviously with the, the tie in there, but it's kind of interesting how those bands are interlocked in the way. Like, yeah, I hate God was essentially the catalyst for this band kind of getting back together years later to and kind of set the ball in motion for them to record new music and stuff. I also think that the first I hate God record was one of the first records that Kevin reviewed and the band got in touch with them and was very thankful for it. Oh, you mean like while he was a music journalist? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. So there you go. I'd have to look that up. That's rad. Really ties the room together, dude. (laughs) Uh, we go in from this, uh, germs cover to judgment which is just i wrote more or less like just a fast fucking yep it's a grind track core track um just great blasting it's got a great mosh riff kind of dead center um it's got these crazy soaring layered guitars under it that are just like what what are we doing what's going (laughs) on um this is the track that sounds like the artwork to me yeah i like like that uh this band is also great with like song structure the bridges of all their songs are so good well i mean if you're gonna like put a riff into the ground and then but the but the fucking the way to break it up this band definitely does that very very well Oh my god and maybe that i don't know if it's the whole band collabing or if like dan is just a really good songwriter yeah i i think it i think it's all there i think it's certainly all there uh brain trust might be another one of my favorites and one of the things I wrote, I mean, yeah, for Rich being such like a newcomer to the band and the genre as a whole, I think he really gets the, a chance to go fucking nuts on it. This was the also the other track that I mentioned had some black metal influence on it. Yes, there's um, if I had heard this track at 15, I would never be able to hear a grindcore record that was just a straight grind record yeah, because yeah. I would go, this is how it all has to sound. And this yep. is the track of like, yeah, it all has to sound like this from now on. This also, I have it in my notes, is like there's these weird werewolf vocals yes. in the background. Yeah, there's somebody howling <laughs> for whatever reason. And I was like, this is so crazy, dude. Like, what are we, this is awesome. This album could best be described as the chaos scene at the end of American Werewolf. <laughs> oh, yeah, and you know, fucking... Uh, Just heads. Oh, God. This track's got that great middle riff that is like perfection. Yes. Oh, the fucking the the bridge like halfway yeah. through the song. It's like cuts. It's just like the bass line, and then there's like a guitar that's playing essentially the same riff. That's like kind of just mixed right under it. Awesome. So great. Uh, then we get into the Pepsi track. 
The what? The Pepsi track. Oh my yes. god. <laughs> yes. And it's the choice of a new generation. I hope that's a Dan quote. <laughs> um great track has like a very has a very I hate God style bridge I to it. I agree. I caught that with like the bass kind of into it and the guitar kind of slides in place the same thing. Definitely a hardcore influence on this fucking song. Um I also kind of like we were talking about earlier as far as like the power violence stuff. I think there's like with the sampling, it reminds what me is a lot that of sample. I don't know. Uh, I, I, there's so again, a few samples on here that I just cannot discern because they're, they're used so sparsely and like so quickly. All I could make out was motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it reminds me of all the slap of him shit where again, like spaz spaz has like a ton of like these like random pole kind of samples from like Kung Fu movies or like random shit. And I'm like, and they're so, you know, like whatever they're quick, maybe, but right. it reminded me of that sort of like kind of grimy kind of like B movie esque, like uh reference in the song, in, in my opinion. And we got, we got more of that on the next track. Uh, mainliner. Mainliner. It's like talking about that Brown shit or whatever. Oh my God. I looked so hard to find that. There are some fine Brown shits in here. <laughs> and I was like, what is, is that a John Waters quote? Like what? Oh, that is would be that? amazing. God. There's a uh, eight tonal guitar. Oh, this is a all great over this. track. This is awesome. Mainliner it's, is such a good song. It's got this melodic bridge with like these great kind of like heavy riff being played under it. Uh, Again, stacking up like the back half of this record with the with banger upon banger. Right. Uh, I mean, yeah. Speaking of, I mean, you go into displacement, which is like talk about dirty and dissonant. It's got it's got like this crazy bass line, mm -hmm. dissonant riff. Uh, there's definitely some playing with like the vocal, like as far as like panning. Yes. When you listen to it with headphones, you can definitely hear like Kevin's kind of all over the place. Um, there's like I don't know, like, again, some of that phaser flange, like, being used on this track. Very, very cool. I, I think this could have been the album closer to me. Like, this could have just faded out the album really well. But you get the the other noise track, Crawl Space, which in my notes is just pain and suffering based off the story. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's, there's a lot going on here. I mean, it's yep. like Damn, more of that high. Bub, bubbling noise. There's, like, computer kind of, like, noises and whistling and screeching and some all more that samples. high pitched screeching is a bass distorted like feeding back it's ter it's him against the amp and he would do he would change the tone and just like do it differently or change a pickup switch or something and it's like my god it's it's funny to like end with a noise track and to think that it it's it's like not surprising because maybe one of my first like introductions to this band was a noise record they did like years later maybe it was like they did it with a kind of like uh, man is the bastard offshoot called called bastard noise and it was like a, a split yeah it was like a split of just like very harsh kind of electronic noise that they did together and like i only picked it up because i'm like oh I've heard a brutal truth like, oh, this is going to be cool. And it's just like all fucking noise. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, they continue to do some of this stuff later on, which is which is pretty cool. But, yeah, there's like it's like a throbbing gristle record or something. Yeah, it's like sampling and, yeah. you know, all these computer noises at the end. Maybe they maybe they finally got coach on the on the record. Craig T. Nelson. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. I, I could maybe understand where. Grindcore fans at the time may may not have been like per, maybe particularly ready for something like this i can't say that there's anything like this that i'm aware of that sounded like this at the time no but this is buck wild uh we did have some reissues or like some special edition stuff that came out so like the record's typically like 42 minutes uh i think it extends maybe to closer to like an hour um because of the the box set that we mentioned earlier with like all of the added kind of like there's like the five, six, seven, eight, nine inches that are added in that box set. There's like also a Japanese like bonus edition that featured some uh, like four more tracks. You have a Pink Floyd cover. You have a 
song called Painted Clowns. Uh, you have a Celtic Frost cover, Dethroned Emperor, and uh, BTITB. Um, yeah, so there's there's some there's some extra stuff. Uh, then there's like even like a Redux, which I was like on Apple Music. I I thought that was the original version for a second because I was like, damn, I don't remember this being an hour. But then, yeah, you forget like it has the Wish You Were Here cover, Dethroned Emperor, Celtic Frost, Painted Clowns, and then eggshells and head cheese are on the on the redux a track called head cheese like that's very i think cattle decapitation has a song called head cheese on one of their very early records which is just perfect it's funny too because going back to like going way back to those cattle decap deep dive episodes we did um you know those first two cattle records sound more like grind records than this thing does yeah kind of yeah in a lot of ways for sure In, in, in a lot of ways like this is this is an outlier this is I, I saw it described as like, this is the record that brought grind into its adolescence, like matured it a little bit. And it's like, oh, okay. But again, I've never heard anybody bring this record up in recent years. And it's like, God, we got we to gotta make that shit happen. We got to start. We, we got to start it with this. We got to make it happen. Um, but again, you have uh, the record comes out, you know. Um, Earache kind of dropped the ball. This was during a period of time when Earache was starting to go through their problems. They were really out of touch with a lot of things. This is 1994, so death metal was already starting to either hit the majors or even starting to kind of, it was peaking. It was starting to do this. Like any trend would, it happens. It's part of it. Um, But this is when Earache was starting to maybe go a different direction with what they were signing rather than um, still holding the bands that helped build the label and promoting them. I mean, during 94, you've got, let's see, Heartwork came out in 93. Um, you know, Slaughter the Soul came out in 95. So you're at a weird point for Earache. So what, Covenant Covenant comes out in 93? Mm-hmm. So yeah, you kind of have like all of their, you had all this promotion kind of like heavily garner to these bands and then yeah i think what yeah domination is like the last one for the major like they hope to kind of recapitalize that so yeah i i'd imagine they are probably because they had a lot of failures you know like covenant was definitely the top all the records that they had hoped would kind of build off of covenant as we mentioned in the you know in that episode where they didn't even generate like a third of like what covenant did uh, so yeah, if it's not working, you're probably going to try to like go a different direction yeah. and you have a record like this, which is, which is like completely and totally abrasive and weird. I don't think this is going to be the priority or that's at least what I understood from the, from the research we did. We talked about 1994 and I think what we didn't necessarily bring up is that 1994 was the year black metal took over. Yeah. That was the year that Norway became the biggest talk of the underground. Uh, and a lot of labels were leaning into that. And Earache actually didn't really sign any black metal bands. Uh, a lot of those bands stuck with kind of smaller labels or like European labels, Century Media, Nuclear Blast, stuff like that. Um, and I don't know if, and I think by this time too, a lot of word of mouth had happened from um, some of the bands that were on Earache about how maybe they were treated or, you know, so on and so forth. Jeff Walker has not stopped talking, and that's one of my favorite things. It's been 30 years, and I'm so glad he still does. Somehow, they were able to come to an understanding. Like, Danny met with Digby. I think that he was, like, visiting in New York or something like that. They had a meeting, and basically, I think they came to an understanding. Like, you know, Danny was pretty level-headed about it. It was like, hey, it seems like this is not something you guys are kind of wanting to push this hard maybe you're going a different direction this is what we do maybe we can find a home somewhere else a different label that will want to push us to the fullest extent and it seemed like relapse was pretty interested in the band and actually i think i read somewhere where they maybe even like gave them money like once they ended their deal with earache they were like yeah here's the check before they even kind of like put something down in ink um so i mean kill trend suicide was a release from 96 that was through relapse. I think they pretty, I think they were with relapse through the rest of their career. Even when they came back again, 
uh, kind of in the in the 2000s or 2010s and stuff. So the first uh, Brutal Truth release I ever purchased was through Relapse. It was one of their it was their reunion album. It was called uh, Evolution Through Revolution. Uh, and it had a track on there called Sugar Daddy that they did a video <laughs> for that I thought was great. Yeah. Uh, they're just in like this. I, it looks like an old practice room and they're just like riffing through it. Just a great video. I think I think Swindle. No, at least for sure. He has talked about I don't know if he owns it or listens to it. Sound of the Animal Kingdom. Yeah, Sound of the Animal Kingdom yeah. uh, from 97. And yeah, so I mean, they basically went on hiatus or they disbanded basically after that. Yep. Um, and they, as we mentioned, you know, got back together through kind of like the catalyst of the I Hate God uh, cover for the kind of, uh, you know, they, their practice space got fucked up through the yep. hurricane. They got a bunch of bands to do it. I think they thought that having Brutal Truth on there as kind of like a, hey, reunion little single would be great. Uh, I think when they, you know, they're just there to cover a song that's a pretty, you know, straightforward, easy song to cover. They're like, hey, maybe we can we still play some of the old shit? Can we still do that? And then they did it. And then it was kind of running from there. Um, you know, they've been busy in other forms of music. I know Danny has like a black metal band. Um, they eventually i think they do a few tours uh they record a little bit more um they eventually split up again in 2014 on dan loker's 50th birthday what a way to top it out run out and run off into the sunset you know he kind of retired from being you know like a full-time musician do other things but yeah i mean i don't know maybe it is like why this band doesn't maybe get as lauded as some of the others like napalm death and you know carcass and maybe it is just because of the it being pretty different and also yeah just like the time at which they existed like it would seem kind of like a very tumultuous era yeah flash in the pan kind of like you're just in it and you're out of it and it's cool i mean this this band has really i i like that we got to kind of sit down and and discuss this record um you know maybe unfortunately because of the a dynamic that Eric had at the time and not being able to promote the record, maybe it at the, you know, until like decibel actually did a hall of fame thing on right. it. It wasn't really like people weren't talking about it, but like you said, like I don't really ever hear people talking about it all that much now either. And it's, it's remarkable because there are a lot of bands in the grind area that owe a lot to this album. Uh, you look at a band like full of hell, Sure. You wouldn't get some of the weird shit. I mean, yeah, they're probably not directly influenced by this album, or they may be and we're unaware, but uh, that band kind of at the forefront of experimentation in that genre, like owes kind of a nod to something like this, you know, almost 30 years. Here we are 30 years later, you know, talking about this thing and uh, it owes a nod to that. And, you know, grind, maybe it wouldn't be as interesting now without something like this or just, you know, a catalog that this band has wouldn't be as interesting without this record, right? Uh, you know, you've got the more straightforward release with their debut, and uh, I need to go back and kind of re-listen to the band's catalog to get kind of a grasp of it, but I feel like this is the outlier in the catalog. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think this is definitely, you know, coming from that debut record and going into this, it's like, I couldn't imagine, you know, as a maybe in like kind of the early days, like the kind of formations of grind having such a, you know, kind of in your face record with that debut and then going like kind of like just all over the place. And I think that's a a testament to Danny and just his love of extreme forms of music. And again, yeah, not only do you have like grind shit going on being influenced, influenced by those Eric bands, but He's clearly listening to industrial music. He's clearly listening to uh, black metal. And yeah, it's just kind of a thing that he has held dearly through his entire existence in this form of music. And uh, yeah, so shout out to this band. Shout out to this record. Uh, Loved it. I'd love to hear from you, the listener. If you're checking this out along with us, uh, let us know what you thought. Let us know if we got something wrong. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. All right, we've reached that point of the episode where we like to recommend things we've been listening to, things we've been checking out. Uh, Dylan, what have you been listening to, bud? 
Uh, what I've been listening to is the most recent single from Vancouver's own Wormwitch. Uh, they'll be releasing a new album on July 26th through Profound Lore Records. It will be a self-titled record, and the track is called The Helm and the Bow. It's great shit. Heavy shit. Uh, it, was a great, it was a great listen to hear it first thing in the morning. My recommendation this week has a bit of a brutal truth connection, kind of tying it into this record. Uh, Degenerate Synapse. They have a self-titled EP, eight songs, ten minutes of blistering Chicago death grind. Uh, I actually talked to the band's vocalist, Dave Hoffer, on our live show, Vocal Distortion. Uh, it's available on our page if you want to check it out. But uh, Dave not only is kind of a vet of the Chicago land scene, he's been a part of the hardcore and metal community for a long time. He also wrote the book on Dan Loker. He uh, wrote Perpetual Conversion, 30 Years and Counting in the Life of Metal. He had some times with the band uh, having been on tour with him. He kind of worked as a roadie. Uh, spending some time after like they had gotten back together. It was like, I think he went to Europe for the first time with the band. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, firsthand experience there, getting to know Danny personally and writing that book. Um, he's also, you know, has experience being like, uh, like you think he would like bought, he was like a buyer for Reckless Records in Chicago, like one of the best kind of record chains in the city. So he had a personal hand and kind of, curating what was going to be in the record stores did like in-store like performances booking bands like that um he's been a freelance writer for like decibel magazine actually did the hall of fame on uh, macabre that record oh Um, okay so check that out uh he runs an archive uh dupage county hardcore which kind of preserves a lot of like maybe releases that you haven't heard or like just stuff that kind of maybe fell to time like over the course of like the past you know, handful of decades. So that's free. You can check that out. Check out like a bunch of stuff from, you know, Chicago, hard, Chicago land, hardcore history. Uh, but yeah, vocalist of degenerate synapse, amazing band. They have an upcoming show. They're going to be opening uh, for cryptopsy, misanthropy and uh, Pythagoras at Reggie's. This is going to be in Chicago, June 3rd tickets for that can be found at the Reggie's website, but yeah, check out the book too. It like provided so much information for this episode in particular. I think it's like maybe 150, 160 pages. Lots of great stories that we probably didn't even cover. Uh, Danny's background, uh, his history through anthrax, nuclear assault, brutal truth, uh, life after that. So check it out. Great read. I think uh, in our interview with Dave, he had mentioned that it's available digitally right now, but it will be available for a second pressing at some point this year. So good. keep your eyes posted for that. So we came, we saw... We broke our necks. We did it without the oldest man on the planet. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about going through this record? Uh, I loved it. I, lo- I thought it was great. I thought it was a good time. Uh, if you would like for us to review a record in particular, something maybe we haven't touched on yet, reach out to us. You can comment below. Uh, email us at riffworshippod at gmail.com. You can always follow us at riffworshippod at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We both have playlists that either of us curate on separate platforms. I have Spotify with riffs on repeat. Dylan's got hit, hits from the crypt on Apple Music. Dylan also does reviews every week, the latest one being the Gate Creeper record. Yes. Uh, awesome. Dark Superstition. Um, so we're going to be reviewing some uh, more records in the future, some contemporary releases, so you can you know, stay up to date on what's going on in your local scene. Right, Dill? That's absolutely right. We got a, I got a few different plans coming down the pipe, so... Uh... Hopefully, everybody that listens enjoys. Absolutely. I'm I'm sure they will. And we'll be back next week. Hopefully, the old man will be with us. But until then, for myself, for Dylan, for Swindle out there in uh, the Citrus State, we've been Riff Worship. We'll see you next time. Bye.